Hi, everyone, and welcome to uh, Facebook Live, a special edition of Facebook Live, Ask the Doctor. This is called Ask the Orthopedic Doctor. And uh, I'm my name is Jeremy Rodriguez, I'm business development here at Waterbury Hospital. And I'm joined today, very excited to have Dr. Samuel Lorenzen with me. And uh, Dr. Lorenzen uh, specializes in orthopedics. And um, we're gonna, tonight we're gonna talk specifically about hip pain, maybe explore hip um, re replacement surgery mm -hmm. or who qualifies for that kind of surgery yeah. and all the things that one might expect. So, um, but first I'd like to just get to know Dr. Lorenz in a little bit. Mm -hmm. So tell me about, uh, tell me about yourself, how long you've been practicing, mm -hmm. where you got your training, stuff like that. Yeah. So, uh, well, first, thanks for having me. This is great that you all are doing this and I'm really excited, uh, for today and the future series that we have. Um, so I am, uh, currently practicing in the Waterbury area. Um, with the neurosurgery, orthopedics, uh, and spine specialist group. Um, so we have a pretty diverse group of uh, specialists and the orthopedics, and particularly the joint replacement surgeons make up a big component of that, that group. Uh, I did my training at uh, University of Connecticut. Prior to that, I was in Philadelphia for medical school, mm -hmm. um, but it was uh, great to spend five years here in my training. Um, after getting this uh, really uh, fantastic, well-rounded orthopedic training at uh, UConn, went to Harvard for a year to do a fellowship mm -hmm. in uh, adult reconstruction. Uh, that's really what my um, you know, uh, primary interest is in. Um, anything related to the hip and knee, um, that's what I uh, specialize in now. Uh, but we see all patients uh, for a multitude of orthopedic-related injuries. So, so after, you, after you went to medical school, what, what made you point towards orthopedics I and mean, what brought, yeah. was there some kind of a epiphany or did so you have personal experience? Yeah, so that's a great question. So I think uh, most people that go into orthopedics, you know pretty early that's something that you want to do. I was always very interested in using my hands as a kid and um, I just had a love for math and science. Uh, I was fortunate to have a great uh, role model of an uncle who was a, uh, a pretty prominent uh, orthopedic surgeon. Uh, so I was very uh, fortunate to get exposed to mm -hmm. uh, different aspects of orthopedics, particularly on the research side uh, and then on the clinical side. So that was a great influence for me. And it's just a lot of fun. It's fun. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's in your blood. Right? Exactly. It's in your yeah, blood. Exactly. It's in my blood. Um, exactly. So what's your favorite part of this specialty? What's the, your favorite yeah. aspect, I guess, of the specialty of orthopedics and maybe even uh, hip and reconstructive type surgery? So I will say, bar none, when you think of all the surgeries that we do of all the specialties, uh, it's very hard to compare the impact that a hip replacement has had on the quality of life for people. Um, so the, the benefit of what I do is that I get to you know, do my work in the operating room, which takes, you know, a few hours. Mm -hmm. um, but to see a patient go from difficulty walking, you know, uh, significant pain just coming into the office, to then after that procedure, they have some post-operative pain, but essentially that pain from arthritis is, is gone. Uh, so to see that quick recovery is just something that um, I was always, you know, so impressed by. Uh, and that's made me want to dedicate my life to doing those same procedures and getting patients that quick recovery. You know, here at the hospital, we, when we see people with a knee replacement or hip replacement, and they tell us they're up and walking that same day. It's like, mm -hmm. it seems like a miracle to me. Right, right. Is that, I mean, it's just like you just got out of the OR two hours right. ago, and now you're, they're walking you down the hall with. with exactly. And, and at, here at Waterbury, we're big components of uh, early mobilization. We recognize the literature all supports that that's key to uh, a patient's recovery. Mm -hmm. um, so you're absolutely right. You know, right after the surgery, um, on uh, certain occasions, we may have patients that are able to go home even the same day. Uh, so that really uh, requires a very good relationship uh, with the operating room team, mm -hmm. um, the physical therapists, the clinicians that are involved. It's a huge uh, collaborative <clears throat> effort to get those patients to be able to get up and moving essentially right after the surgery. Now, is this a relatively new thing in terms of up and going that same day? I mean, maybe yeah. a few decades ago, was that even possible? I mean, I yeah. guess I'm wondering about what the technological advances have been over the years to make it so that someone could get a replaced hip Mm -hmm. and then be up and walking and go home that same day. Like it seems, right. maybe a few decades ago, it seems like maybe that wouldn't have been possible. Yeah, so that's totally true. And if you think about the history of, of hip replacements and just 
the surgical manner in which we treat arthritis. This dates back to the 1800s and, mm -hmm. and the idea that you can have a surgery to treat arthritis. And the, the late um, uh, or, or mid uh, 1900s is when we really saw a lot of these technological advances. When we first started doing hip replacements, it would be uh, pretty common for patients to come into the hospital and stay for a week even before their surgery. You know, so now uh, because of not only uh, uh, good data uh, mm -hmm. that we have uh, to rely on and good scientific studies uh, where we know what actually works and what actually, you know, may not actually be scientifically <clears throat> proven to work. And then also just advances in technology. So a combination of trying to do minimally invasive surgery, which mm -hmm. is you know, what I do and what we do uh, here at Waterbury, uh, to minimize the uh, insult that the muscles and tissues feel, combined with the technological advances has allowed uh, those changes uh, that we see now, where patients can get the surgery and get a pretty quick recovery and back to function. So is it safe to say that you're teaching your uncle things now? <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily say that because he has a lot of things to teach. But uh, when it comes to hip and knee replacements, that's definitely an area uh, that I have a lot of experience. So which brings me to my next question, which is how does somebody know or how when you're doing your assessment, if mm -hmm. someone had what's normal hip pain versus abnormal hip pain yeah. that would require surgery? How, you know, how does somebody... Uh, how do you go about making that distinction yeah. and, and let your patients know what, what their options are? So, you know, in my practice, I see the, the complete range of patients as far as ages go. So, mm -hmm. you know, patients that come in that are a little bit younger, um, it's unlikely that they're going to need a hip replacement or at least have uh, osteoarthritis, uh, yeah. which is, you know, the process where you have your degeneration of your joint, at least have it to a significant degree uh, that they would be candidates for hip replacement. So it's important for me to recognize who's coming into the office, number mm -hmm. one. Um, these could be patients that are very active. You can have a lot of common conditions related to just activity, uh, or you could have uh, middle-aged patients with a little, little bit weekend warriors, maybe a little bit deconditioned, and then they go out and start doing these activities. Right. That can lead to you know, uh, issues with tendonitis, you know, bursitis, a lot of things related to that that are short of something that would require an actual hip replacement. When you're thinking about hip replacements, we're thinking about patients that are a little bit older, right. have had that wear and tear going on for a longer period of time. Those are most of the patients that would be candidates for the hip replacement. So it's important to recognize why that patient's coming in and address exactly what their concerns are. So there are certainly non-surgical options for certain people. Exactly. And yeah. then surgical options for other people. And exactly. you will make that distinction. You don't have to know going in Right. As a patient, I'm going to go see Dr. Lorenzen and I need to know what I want. Like you're going to, I, I mean, it sounds right. obvious, but some people, they just, they don't know. Why would I need to go an orthopedic guy just because I'm having pain? Yeah. So I think right. the, the, the way the patient should approach pain to the hip is one, try to be in tune with your body and mm -hmm. recognize if you felt that you've done something different recently, because yeah. that could be a key indicator that maybe uh, you, something uh, underlying cause of that pain, maybe something that your primary care doctor should take a look at first. Right. You know, if you're active, you know, you go to the gym, you work out, you're going to be sore, right? Yeah. The muscles are responding to that activity. So there's a difference between pain because of normal activities and maybe just did overdid it a little bit mm -hmm. versus pain that is one prolonged. If it's not resolving in a few days, it's not responding to over-the-counter anti-inflammatories and medications. Um, and, you know, you, you try to rest or have a period of rest from whatever you believe may have caused that pain. If you see that pain persisting, that's when you want to ask somebody. And that could either be through your primary care doctor, mm -hmm. uh, some Sometimes you can go directly to orthopedic surgeon, but our primary care doctors, we have great relationships with them yeah. through NOS, um, and we really feel that that team approach to the patient care is important. So I always uh, recommend to patients, if you ever have any concerns, you know, call your primary care doctor mm -hmm. right away, you know, uh, and they can advise you if something needs to come in to be seen. Um, but typically when you have pain that is progressing, getting worse, uh, despite those efforts, that's when you want to get checked out. Yeah. And then we'll make the decision in working with the primary care doctor and our evaluation to decide, is this something that needs to be addressed uh, with further non-operative treatments or if surgery is the right next step? Okay, so let's walk through that process. So they go into your office, you <coughs> evaluate them, maybe mm -hmm. you know, there's a series of tests or whatever it is that you do. Explain mm -hmm. like how that process goes through and then we'll get to the point where you have some props here that I yeah. would love to see. <laughs> and um, where you elect to, uh, to suggest uh, hip surgery mm -hmm. uh, and and let's talk about the hip surgery. So yeah, somebody comes into your office, what can they expect? So the first thing is uh, 
getting a good rapport with that person. Mm -hmm. It's important for me to understand you know, who this person is um, because that all can factor into what I think is going on with them and uh, factor into how the treatment plan may be impacted and their recovery uh, subsequent to that. So uh, for me, I always try to get a, a pretty thorough background of the <clears> patient. <throat> I want to know what they do for work because that may give me some keys as to what their actual yeah. issues may be. Um, I want to know what their home life is like, and I want to know what their symptoms are. How long has this been going on? Um, has it been getting progressively worse? Is it getting a little bit better now that you've started treating it, but it's still lingering? These are all really important questions for me to know. Is this yeah. something that may need to be addressed more urgently, or is this something that we can you know, try to, to get you over that the, the pain hurdle that you still right. have, even if you've tried some treatments? So a lot of it is about the conversation with me and, and, and understanding what the patient's issues, issues are. Then the most important thing after that is a physical exam. You know, I, I, uh, we get patients all the time and they'll tell me what their issues are and they start out by, you know, explaining, uh, well, this is what my x-ray showed. I don't really care about the imaging right. yet. I'm more uh, interested in what you have to say, what your experiences have been with this pain, uh, and then two, what my physical exam is. Those are the two most okay. important things. That's what my you know, medical foundation was based on, you know, understanding, getting good history, uh, and then getting good physical exam. So like exam. you started the basics, literally <laughs> right. the basics. Right, and that's like, how, and it's all about the basics with this, even yeah. though we're putting in some fancy hardware sometimes and doing these really specialized techniques, it's all about the basics of understanding what the patient's actual issues yeah. are, uh, and then doing a thorough exam to get a good uh, uh, a diagnosis uh, of what the problem is. Yeah. We rely on imaging a lot in orthopedics, so there's usually uh, an x-ray or something involved, uh, but that is based on, again, my, the patient's history right. uh, and the physical exam. After uh, review the imaging, uh, then I try to give a very uh, thorough um, treatment plan uh, to that patient. But I tell them all the possible options. You know, when you think about arthritis, there's a spectrum of treatments. Yeah. It's important for me to tell them why some things are off the table for them. If their arthritis has advanced to the point where I don't think they're gonna necessarily benefit from you know, a steroid injection into the hip, which is a pretty uh, common way for us to yeah. get the inflammation process to calm down. If I think their arthritis is, is past that stage, I'm not gonna offer that, but I'm gonna tell them why, because it's very common for them to have friends that have had that procedure. Well, that's what I was gonna say. Yeah. My friend said, if I, you just get this shot, it lasts for exactly. however yeah. many months yep. and you're good. <clears throat> Right. It's magic. So for some people, that may be the case. For right. some, it's not. So it's important for me to go through that spectrum of, the in the simplest form, avoiding the activities that cause pain. Mm -hmm. you know, kind of a, a, a joke within medicine to say <laughs> that, but that is helpful sometimes. Right. The other end of that spectrum is surgery, and that's typically like a hip replacement. So there's a lot of options in between that, and my goal is to always optimize those non-operative treatments and utilize surgery when it's appropriate. Right. So we're going to look and see what's best for the patient as you have done the exam, not what their their uncle told them to do or their <laughs> friend at the senior center or right. at the club right. told them to do. Like, listen, let me take a look. You may not be a good candidate for this or, that right. or the other, but we're going to do it. So yeah. let's go. Now, we hear a lot in um, on TV commercials, radio, the anterior approach. Right. Right. And um, you, there's a couple of different approaches to mm -hmm. doing the surgery. And Correct. please explain to us the difference <laughs> between the posterior approach and the anterior approach. Because yeah. I personally hear it on, t on, on uh, TV and, in, and on the radio, and I'm like, I have no idea what they're right. talking about. Right. <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah, so the best way that I can describe arthritis, so arthritis is the process where the smooth cartilage surface in our joints, whether it's a hip joint, knee joint, any joint, we'll focus mm -hmm. on the hip, obviously, for today. When that cartilage surface starts to break down, can be from a lot of different underlying causes, generally a wear and tear, either is a, you know inciting event or uh, causes the progression of arthritis. The cartilage doesn't have the ability to heal itself. Um, so it's important for me to take a step back and explain like what it is that we're actually mm -hmm. treating. So that's what the process is, and it's an inflammatory uh, process. So the way that we take out or address the arthritis as when it, we're at the kind of end line of treatment options is to go in and take out those areas that have the arthritis. Mm -hmm. So for example, <clears throat> hold these up. We have uh, a femur here. This represents the femoral head. So this is an area you see smooth here where uh, it's covered in cartilage. And this is an area where it interacts with the cup or the acetabulum. <clears throat> and we can see here how uh, over time that grinding can cause wear and tear of that cartilage. Um, so that creates this 
inflammatory process. Mm -hmm. You go and walk or do your activities, that grinding continues to occur. Right. You get a cycle of inflammation and a cycle of pain. So going back to your original uh, question, <clears throat> my goal as a surgeon <clears throat> is to get to that hip joint, right? Mm -hmm. Think of the hip joint like a kitchen inside of a okay. nice house, and you're my patient, and I want to make the best meal possible for you, okay? In order for me to do that, I have to get to your kitchen. Nice. Same thing, I need to get to the hip joint. Okay. Now, you can think about the approaches to the hip and everything around the hip, all your muscles, skin, and tissue, like a house. There's essentially three ways you can get into a house. I could go through the front door, I could go to the back door, or I could go through the window. The back door or garage, for example. Yeah. yeah. So when you think of the back door or garage, it's usually bigger than your front door. And that's why we think of the posterior approach to the hip. Mm -hmm. If you have a garage, most people uh, you know, that have garages probably go through the garage yeah. to get into their home. Yeah. The posterior approach to the hip is actually still the most commonly performed way to get into the hip. It's a tried and true way. <clears throat> it's very good because we get a lot of exposure. We get to see things really well. And as a surgeon, that's utmost important for me. Yeah. Um, we still do it in a minimally invasive uh, possible way um, where we make a small incision uh, as possible and kind of extend that as we need to. But the posterior approach just allows for great exposure. If you've had a surgery gotcha. before, if you had a hip replacement, um, and for whatever reason, you know, there's, there's a shelf life on all these implants. We could probably talk about this a little bit more later. Yeah. Um, but if for whatever reason you need to get another procedure done and you already have hardware, the posterior approach is oftentimes the best way to do that because you get really good exposure to really see everything, mm -hmm. perform everything in a safe way. Now, we think about going through the window. Most people wouldn't want to go through the window. If I try to uh, go through your second floor window, I may damage something in the process. The direct lateral approach is another approach that we commonly use, and you can think about that as going through the window. <clears throat> now, in order to do that approach, you sometimes have to violate some of the muscles a little bit, yeah. so we get a little bit concerned uh, for patients that may be a little too deconditioned, we're violating their muscles. They may have a little bit tougher recovery uh, process uh, you know, because of that. So ideally, you don't necessarily want to go through the window, but sometimes there's uh, the scenarios where you feel yeah. that that may be best. So now that gets us to the front door. Front door, usually a little bit smaller than your garage. Mm -hmm. It's kind of what the anterior approach to the hip is. So the, the benefits of the anterior approach is that it really helps us try to prevent significant uh, soft tissue destruction. Um, now, all of these muscles heal uh, yeah. you know, uh, after the recovery process, but the anterior approach has been shown that patients feel a little bit better right after surgery. So if you're concerned about someone that really needs to get you know, maybe back to work a little bit faster, um, then that's a good approach because at least in the early recovery period, the mobilization is a little bit better. They're yeah. able to get around a little bit better. Now, when you look at these patients long-term, say you know, three, six months out from surgery, or six months plus from surgery, generally they're all doing about the same, okay? okay. So, you know, there is pros and cons to all of these uh, different approaches. The downside of the anterior approach is that it really relies on good patient selection. Patients that are, you know, a little bit heavier, um, you know, patients that may have a little bit of a, a belly that may be over their, where the incision would be, those mm -hmm. would be concerns uh, where I wouldn't recommend that approach to them. You know, as an right. orthopedic joint replacement surgeon, the one thing I always try to minimize is a chance for infection. Uh, there is some evidence that you may have a slightly higher chance of infection with that uh, approach in the wrong patient. Right. So it really all relies, again, like I talked about before, just understanding the patient, who they are and their needs, and that can really help uh, me as a surgeon determine what's gonna be the best approach. But ultimately, it's a house, you wanna get into the house. Uh, they all have their pros and cons, yeah. but the most important thing is finding a safe way into that house. And so when you talk about <clears throat> tissue destruction, you're talking about when you cut the person mm -hmm. yeah. and you're going through muscle and tissue and things like that. It's natural. Really We're talking. creating trauma, exactly. So even uh, you can have trauma from an accident <clears throat> and injury, but surgery is a is a uh, uh, a form of trauma. It's right. just a very controlled Control, form of yeah. trauma. Now, we do everything to get those uh, tissues to heal as quickly as and uh, as well as possible. And that's where the good relationship with our uh, the uh, physical therapist really comes into play um, okay. because they can recognize which approach, uh, uh, you know, 
not only can they recognize just by seeing the incision, but they recognize, uh, you know, some of the uh, different uh, issues related to the recovery based on specific approaches. Right. So if somebody had the anterior approach, maybe they do different physical exercises post-surgery versus... Yeah, there's a little bit difference. Right. And also what we watch out for, what we don't want to happen is after you have that surgery, that ball to come out of the cup, mm -hmm. that's something that we spend a lot of time in the operating room trying to make sure uh, we can prevent. Um, so to letting those tissues heal, you don't want to put the ball in, in certain positions. Mm -hmm. So if your incision is around the front here, uh, you generally want to avoid positions that are going to bring that ball to the front. Right. If, your, if your incision is more along the back, you generally want to avoid situations that are going to put that that uh, ball closer to the back. So we do often what's called hip precautions. So most people that get a hip replacement have a, a, a few months period, a few weeks to months period, uh, where we're avoiding certain uh, uh, positions of that leg based on the approach that they have. Okay. And that's just all to give the muscles the correct time to heal. And that's where our physical therapists play a great role uh, in recognizing, um, uh, you know, what type of surgery they had. And, and uh, it, just as an aside, I, I do think it's, it's important for everyone to recognize that the anterior approach, you hear it a lot, like you said mm -hmm. on the news now, this is not a new approach. It's actually an approach that's been around for a long time. And actually, Waterbury Hospital is one of the leading uh, centers for promoting the anterior approach uh, as a safe way to do this elective surgery. So Dr. Keggy has been a great uh, um, uh, leader for the orthopedic surgery department for a long time. Uh, who since stopped uh, operating, but still very active in right. the department. Uh, he was one of the real pioneers of this approach uh, for this elective procedure. So we've been doing this for a long time here, uh, and I'm happy to say I'm, I'm facile, and my training has allowed me to have good experience with all, all the approaches so I could give uh, the best approach, I think, to the, to the right patient. So it, it really is about options, right? Options for the exactly. patient, options for you as a surgeon, so you get the, the best result in the quickest amount of time, people mm -hmm. get back into their lives and, exactly. and all that. That's great. I did get a question from the audience, and they mm -hmm. wanted to know the difference between arthritis and bursitis. Yeah, so great question. So I see particularly patients that are a little bit older, maybe a little bit deconditioned, um, uh, you know, those are the patients that are going to, again, have that kind of wear and tear uh, arthritis. Mm -hmm. um, bursitis can really affect anyone, and, you know, arthritis can as well. But I see a lot of patients that come in with bursitis. Now, when we think about bursitis around the hip, there's generally uh, over <clears throat> this part of the bone, this is called your greater trochanter, this is your lesser trochanter, and there's a lot of muscles that attach in this area and a lot of muscles that, or, or some muscles that pass this area as well. When we think about the bursa, the bursa, think of it like a sack of fluid. Mm -hmm. And it's a sack of fluid that tends to collect a lot of the inflammatory cells. So when the pressure is applied to this sack of fluid that already has all these cells that are part of the inflammatory process, right. Pressure on that area sends a signal to your brain that there's pain, there's something wrong there. So bursitis in this area is usually um, the underlying inflammatory process and also the muscle that runs over that being deconditioned. So if that muscle, particularly the IT band, which runs from past your knee joint all the way past your hip joint, if that muscle uh, is deconditioned, which it commonly is in patients as we get older, mm -hmm. it gets very tight. So you think as you go to stand up, that muscle is engaging to help stabilize your knee and your hip. That's putting pressure over that sack of fluid with the inflammatory cells. So okay. essentially, every time you walk, every time you stand up or a lot of times people say whenever they sleep on their side, they have pain. Because of the pressure. Because of that pressure, okay. right. Arthritis is different in that arthritis is affecting the joint itself. So it's an okay. intra-articular process inside the joint, intra, and the bursitis is an extra-articular process happening outside the joint. Okay. But they definitely can present the same way. The biggest key to me is if you point directly to the lateral side or the side of your hip right over this bone, mm -hmm. it's almost always bursitis. Now you can have bursitis with some uh, component of arthritis as well. And there's some other things that could be happening in this area. Yeah. But in my experience, bursitis is so common uh, that you know, we see it all the time. And uh, the arthritis itself, <clears throat> again, this is a, a, a different process where it usually takes some time yeah. to really become symptomatic for it, if it is just wear and tear yeah. uh, osteoarthritis. But this type of pain, you feel in the groin. So when patients uh... say, I don't have any pain in my groin, all the pain is on the side of my hip, 
then yeah. to me, that's more likely uh, okay. bursitis. Okay. And there's some you know, different treatment options depending on what the issue is. Um, bursitis can be a little bit stubborn some for some patients, um, but that's where a good orthopedist can uh, you know, give you a good treatment plan, mm -hmm. uh, and, and there's a lot of different ways to address it. Generally, when you're talking about bursitis, um, some helpful things are, one, focus on that tight muscle, yeah. because if we address the inflammation, if we give you medications or sometimes a steroid injection to address the pain from the bursitis, we, we're not addressing that tight muscle that's constantly causing right. this to flare up. So for me, it's always a, a two-pronged approach at least. So I like to address the pain, but I also want to address the issue that is going to prevent this from happening again, potentially. So a combination of physical therapy, combination of anti-inflammatories, that's really helpful for the bursitis. Okay. Similar to arthritis, but arthritis, if it gets bad enough, that's when we start talking about hip replacements. Hip replacements, okay. That's really, that's really interesting because I think that people interchange those two. Right? Yeah, that's right. And now you can have both yeah. happening at the same time. Okay. Um, but uh, the main way to really tell the difference is, <clears throat> is most of your pain in the groin? That's almost always going to be uh, arthritis uh, or some intra-articular process, rather. It could be other things going on, but it's something inside the hip joint. Pain on the outside pointing to the side of your hip, that's usually bursitis. Okay. Very good. Thank you. I appreciate the explanation. Um, now, I got another question here about um, robotic surgery versus traditional surgery. So we're very yeah. fortunate here at Waterbury House. We have very two cool, very cool robots here. Yeah. Two very yeah. cool robots. What is your, um, I, I guess, what do you prefer mm -hmm. and, um, and what is the difference? Why, what would make you choose one versus the other based on the patient or the yeah. procedure or whatever? Yeah, so great question. And I think, again, this is just another example of how Waterbury Hospital has really been on the forefront of what we can do uh, in orthopedics and uh, surgery and medicine in general. Mm -hmm. So if you drive up to Waterbury Hospital, the first thing you'll see is this, the uh, uh, Surgical Center for Innovation. And, yeah. and uh, so Waterbury has really embraced technology mm -hmm. um, as uh, you know, an adjunct for uh, you know, what we can do to provide to patients. But again, I'm all about fundamentals. Yeah. You have to be uh, you know, uh, confident that what you're going to do in the operating room um, is going to get the patient better. Um, now, robotics can play a key role in that. So the times I would use that if I feel that the patient has maybe some significant deformity, if they were you know, born with hip dysplasia or something yeah. like that, something where their anatomy is not uh, the common anatomy that we would see. That's where the surgical planning that comes in robotics, and that's really what it, the key is. A robotics really allows us to plan a little bit better mm -hmm. uh, and have a little bit more precision to some degree in the operating room. What we have seen with the robotics is that, um, you know, long term do they do better? There's, you know, uh, some uh, case to be made that, um, again, depending on certain situations, you may have some impact on your outcomes. Again, it's just an adjunct tool for me, um, but it is something that I try to embrace. I've always tried to embrace technology in the operating room. Um, so, you know, again, patients where I feel that they can really benefit based on their anatomy, um, something that may make the case a little bit atypical, yeah. uh, that extra planning that uh, is afforded by having that extra technology uh, is, are the times where I feel is beneficial. Um, but, you know, I think just doing that surgery well without a robot involved. Uh, again, for the right patients, they'll do just fine without the robot. But uh, it's really a, a kind of case-by-case -case basis, and that's where you have to have a good relationship with your orthopedic surgeon uh, and trust their advice. So this is what I love about the Waterbury area, right? Because Waterbury Hospital, I say this all the time, we are small enough because Waterbury is a community. Mm -hmm. All the doctors know each other. Everyone here knows each other. And you'll get, right, right. you're right. relatively new in town, but you're going right. to get to know every primary care, all the specialists, everybody. You're going right. to know. And, but we're big enough and we have the technology mm -hmm. to do all the fancy stuff where you don't have to go out of town for yeah. these things. Yeah. That's what I love about Waterbury. And I want to just, um, we're all the time. And I thank you so much for, for doing this. It was my pleasure. Um, I want to thank Dr. Uh, Samuel Lorenzen. He is with NOS, which is um, Neurosurgery, Orthopedics, and Spine Specialists. And he does his surgeries right here at Waterbury Hospital. And we are very uh, pleased to have him. He's relatively new in town, but we love, we love having him because he brings a wealth of experience and knowledge all about 
hip replacement and reconstruction and getting our patients back to their lives yeah, and key. active lives. So exactly. thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been uh, great to be here. Great support, uh, great hospital, and I'm looking forward to serving a greater Waterbury community. Take care, everyone. Thank you.